Sponsored by the James Madison Council and the Institute of Museum and Library Services and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Hello, and welcome to the 2021 Library of Congress National Book Festival. I'm Osita Wanevu, a contributing editor of The New Republic, and I'm here with Simon Winchester to talk about his book, Land, How the Hunger for Ownership Shaped the Modern World. To learn more about our authors, check out loc.gov slash bookfest. Now, before we get, begin, I want to let you know that we'll save the last 10 minutes of this 30-minute live event to respond to audience questions. And you can actually start submitting your questions right now. Simon, thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's lovely to be here, Sita. So you chose a very large and broad topic for this book, uh, in some ways one of the largest possible topics. Uh, but at the end of the book, you mentioned that you came to it from a discussion with your wife about a fairly specific thing, American immigration policy. Can you talk about that conversation, how it led you to think about land and its history? I think the, what we were thinking of was when people came here, particularly in the 19th century, from Europe, um, what did they have in their mind? Um, and when they arrived here, based on their experience, land ownership, king, how did they apply that thing when they arrived? And the basic point is until the 17th century, um, people didn't own land in Britain, 1604. And they were, people were in large numbers. Uh, I'm just thinking that my internet connection may have failed. Um, I'm just going to reconnect and see if it has. Um, so just hold your horses for a second. I can actually hear you, Simon. I don't know if anybody else can, but I can hear you pretty well. Can you hear me? Well, all right. In that case, if you can hear mm -hmm. me, I just all of my seats are still photographing myself, which is particularly disagreeable. But all right. Um, it's a great photo, so too, actually. Previously, villages in England had... Well, thank you so much. <laughs> People um, living in England in the 17th century, 16th century, didn't own land. They were... The land was commonly held. Then came what were called the, uh, the Enclosures Acts, and all of a sudden, land became privately owned. And people were, um, who had previously used the, what was called common land, were booted off it. And um, they came to London or Birmingham or Manchester or wherever and became sort of disgruntled former landowners who had been booted off their land because of this new principle of enclosure. And a number of them, those that didn't necessarily go to London or Liverpool or Birmingham, crossed the Atlantic or the Indian and the Pacific Oceans to go to these newly found by Westerners countries, the Americas or uh, um, Australasia, and started settling in those places, but imbued with the idea that we've been dispossessed. If we find any people here, we're jolly well going to dispossess them. And that's exactly what happened. The whole mantra of land ownership which had made them disgruntled because they had their land taken away, suddenly became applied in particularly North America, particularly in Massachusetts and Virginia, the early places to be settled by white colonists. And if they found any people there, they then dispossessed them. So the infection began in Europe was immediately transported to the new world. Right. And, you know, one of the things that I liked about the book, too, is that uh, you talk about that broad historical perspective, but you also begin by talking about your own personal experience with land ownership as a jumping off point for everything you, you delve into, both the history of native dispossession and, and everything else. Um, it begins with your purchase of a tract in upstate New York, which is small in the grand scheme of things, but in talking about what that land had once been, you lead the reader to consider larger things. So can you talk a little bit about how you came to learn about your own land and how learning about it changed your own experience of it? It did indeed. So I bought, um, when I used to live in Hong Kong, and when I left Hong Kong at the end of the 1990s, I came to America and um, settled here and bought a little house in the, um, essentially in the Hudson Valley, and um, looked, fell in love with the house. And uh, a local hunter said he didn't want to own the land that surrounded my house because he had to pay taxes on it. 
why didn't I buy it from him? He named a price and it wasn't very good land and it was very low price. So I bought it and um, didn't really think too much about it until 2011. And 2011 was when I became a citizen of this country. And all of a sudden, knowing that I owned, if ownership is the right thing to say, I, my situation, that I owned a piece of the United States, that I was quite literally invested in this kind of my situation. And I became very interested in the land. And I wanted to know particularly who had um, owned it before me. So I went to the, the, the records office in Poughkeepsie and Dutchess County and found the deeds where I bought it in the early 2000s. And when someone who was belonged to a chap called Cesar Luria, who he bought it from in the 1940s, 30s. Then, as I went back, 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 the deeds became handwritten rather than typewritten, and then became less and less legible, and the pieces of paper were um, sort of pretty, pretty moth-eaten and so forth. But then, interestingly enough, they ceased being in English. They were, they were in Dutch, because that part of the United States was colonized, of course, before it was the United States, by the Dutch rather than the English. And the people who they bought it from, in other words, the people on the other side of the deeds, um, didn't sign it with names in the way that I had, but put little X here or a little drawing of a deer or some antlers or something like that. And these, of course, I realized were the original inhabitants. These were the, the Mohican people, the Stockbridge Muncie people, the Lenape people, and further north, the Iroquois people. And that continuity of these documents fascinated me because what was the difference in the attitude of the Mohican to their land and my attitude to the land? I considered that I owned it. Did they? Well, it turned out, no, they did not. They regarded themselves merely as stewards of the land. That famous remark by Chief Seals, who his name was memorialized in Seattle today, said, no more can we own the land than we can own the ocean or own the breeze. No, we can only look after it and hope that the land will look after us. So that difference in attitude, ownership or non-ownership, really triggered the, the writing of this book. And I found it a fascinating question. Absolutely. So as you just mentioned, I mean, native dispossession is one of the major through lines uh, throughout the entire book. Um, and you talk about not just native dispossession here in the United States, but you, know, you also talk about African colonization a good deal. You talk a lot about Australia. And these are all different places with different histories, but what are some of the commonalities that you see between them in the history of how land has been taken uh, and the impact that dispossession can have on both the dispossessed and, and the natural landscape? Well, I mean, a completely fascinating topic, and it would make for a very long book in and of itself. Mm. The, the brutality of colonization, particularly in Africa, and I commend, obviously, the, the book about, about, about the, the King, King Leopold's ghosts, about what went on in, in the Congo in the 19th century. But what we, the British, did in Australia and New Zealand is appallingly bad. It's interesting, though, isn't it, and I mentioned it in the book, when Captain Cook arrived in Botany Bay and was it 1787, I think it was, he and Joseph Banks, who was the extremely clever botanist who was collecting fauna and flora from this vast expedition that Cook led, um, he noticed from the bow of the ship as they nosed their way um, into essentially what is now just south of Sydney, that the landscape, there were trees, yes, but it looked like an English gentleman's estate, as he put it because there were alleys of trees, there were plots of what looked like vegetable gardens and flower gardens. And whoever inhabited this countryside had nurtured it, had taken care of it. And clearly these people, who we now of course know to be the indigenous or the Aboriginal people of Australia, were as sophisticated in their attitude to their land as we thought ourselves to be. Now, as it happened, the encounter in Sydney didn't go well. But further north, about 800 miles north in what is now Queensland, the two sides got on much more amicably. 
and both Banks and Cook came away with the view that we are dealing with people who ought not to be brutally colonized. Rather, our relationship with them should have been one of engagement. That, however, was not the view taken back in London when Cook and Banks got home and these people were regarded as primitive at best or not human beings. I mean, I dedicate the, the book to a, a Ponca, a Native American, who was only as late as the late 19th century, was only then by the US Supreme Court declared to be a human being. It is extraordinary, is it not, that Aboriginal peoples, Indigenous people, were by the British particularly not regarded as humans. And if they weren't, and if the lands that, quote, we discovered, unquote, were not thought to be inhabited by people, then they were in law, in our law anyway, terra nullius, empty land, and we could colonize it willy-nilly. Willy -nilly. So our attitude of colonizing opened up a whole slew of unfair and atrocious behavior, which I hope this book illustrates. Yeah, I think it does that pretty well. Um, you know, another portion of the book uh, isn't really about land itself so much as it is about maps, how we draw out, define, and categorize places and what happens when we do. And there are two parts of this section that I hope you, you can talk about a little bit. Uh, the, one, the first one is, you know, a smaller thing, the, the culture of maps in Britain. Before reading this, I didn't really know that there was such a widespread love and reverence for maps in, in the UK. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the Ordnance Survey maps, you know, what they are and wh why they mean so much to people. Um, and the second thing I was hoping you could talk about is the International Map of the World, that 19th century project to create a common standardized map uh, that ultimately failed. Why did it fail? And what should that suggest to us about the politics of land? That's a lovely question. And I seldom get asked it. So I'm, I'm thank you very much for indulging my particular passion for maps. Um, well, the Ordnance Survey, the OS maps, as they're called in Britain, they go back and the ordnance, it's, it's where you cite your cannons. So these were originally military maps made in Britain originally at the scale of one inch to the mile. That's one to 63360, which every school child in England knows those numbers. There were about 250 of them, I think. And you could go to almost any shop in Britain that sold, you know, candies and tobacco and things like that. And there would be the local OS maps um, folded um, such that if you unfold them, you can either buy them such that you can use them in the rain, they're, they're waterproof, or less expensively ones that will not stand up to hard weather. But if you ever go walking, and of course the British are great walkers, um, there would be a map for you. And I was in Scotland, well, before the pandemic, and wanted a map of the island of Rase in Western Scotland. And there it was, map number 42 or something, and pay about two pounds for it. They're wonderful, wonderful maps, all down to the same scale, the same colors, the same what are called conventional signs. You know, this is a church with a steeple. This is a church with a spire. This is a post office. This is a telephone box. And you have as a school child to learn these things and you'll be on the chalkboard. The instructor will draw a symbol and you'll have to say, oh, that's a, a, a B-class road or that's a 500 foot contour line or that's a wetland. Well, this whole idea of a unified series of maps was then expanded onto the global scale in the late 1880s, I think it was, at the Geographical Congress held, I think, in Switzerland. And it was championed by a man called Albrecht Penck, who said, well, the British have done very well with the one per, per six inch to the mile maps of the British islands. Let's do it for the whole world. And we'll do it at one to the scale of a million. And the whole world, if it's mapped, and the projection of the maps is such that if you stuck them all together with tape, you would produce a sphere one millionth the size of the sphere or the spheroid that is our planet, a millionth smaller. And everyone thought, what a capital idea. And he said very wisely, you can't have the British mapping their own country and France mapping theirs and America mapping theirs. Let's get you know, the British to map Bolivia and the Argentinians to map Russia so that there's a sort of cartographic neutrality about it. Well, that worked pretty well. By 1914, the outbreak of the First World War, there were about 120 of the projected 850 sheets completed. All the same colors, all the same contour lines, everything in English, but using metrical measurements. And they're beautiful things to behold. 
And then the um, they uh, the First World War happened. They picked it up again in the 1920s. And by the time of the Second World War, there were maybe 400 completed. Same thing, began it again in 1948, headquarters in Southampton in southern England. But slowly the impetus for doing it began to fade. No one's quite sure why, except that the growth of commercial aviation meant that similarly scaled maps showing the highest point so that your aircraft wouldn't crash into it, they became an imperative. Whereas these maps that I'm talking about were a luxury, really, whereas aeroplanes really do have to know where they are in the world so they don't go crashing into Mount Everest or the Grand Teton or something. So they took the energy away from the international cartographic community such that by the 1980s, when the United Nations was looking after this project, with something like 800 of the 850 sheets completed, there was a meeting in Bangkok in which they said, let's abandon it. And the last collection, I spent a long time searching for it, where was the definitive collection? I don't say the Library of Congress has got one, but there was supposed to be a collection in New York with the American Geographical Society, not the national, but the American, much smaller organization. And they moved from a very swanky headquarters with lots of room for map cabinets in the 1990s to a rather smaller place in Brooklyn, and they lost them or gave them away. And then I tramped all over the country to various map libraries looking until one day I was on a book tour in all places, Milwaukee. And I was introduced to a, my talk on a completely different subject it was on the fourth floor of a library at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee campus. And I walked in and there was every imaginable globe and thousands upon thousands of map cabinets and this wonderful lady called Marcy Bidney. And I stepped forward and I said, you haven't got, and she said, I have got, I know what you're looking for. She walked over to a cabinet and opened a drawer and in it were sheet after sheet after sheet of these beautiful maps of the most obscure corners of the world done in what I still think of as a great piece of cartographic visionary behavior, um, which was abandoned in the 1980s. So it's a very long answer to your question, but if anyone wants to go and see them, go to Milwaukee. A, a long uh, but wonderful answer. And honestly, it, it, it would be impossible to cover everything that you encompass in this book uh, in, in just 20 minutes time. Um, but I, I think you've done a good job of giving people a taste and they can look to the book for the rest. Before we, we turn on to the, uh, the audience questions, I did want to get a chance to ask you the theme uh, question for the festival this year. Uh, the festival's theme is open a book, open the world. Uh, you're the author of many, many, many books. I think over 20 books, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so this is a question really suited to you. How have books opened your world? It's funny, I, I had no warning of this question until I said, what is this question? And you told me about 20 minutes ago. And um, so it, by coincidence, I've just reviewed a book um, by a chap called Colin Thubron in Britain on um, the Amur River, which is a river that divides Russia from China. and um, is one of the great sort of unsung big rivers of the world. So there's a classic example of I open a book and my vision of the world is enhanced. I've just done a review, I think it was in the last week's New York Times, chap Tom Standage, a, a, hist a short history of motion, which takes us from the invention of the wheel, which wasn't invented in most places we think, but in what is modern day Poland, and um, to the invention of the motor car and uh, the future of the motor car. I wasn't very interested in the future, but the past, and did you know the first ever journey taken by car was when Mrs. Benz borrowed inadvertently her newly invented husband's car, which had never traveled on the road at all in the middle of the night and filled it up with petrol. It wasn't called petrol, it was called Ligroin, strange name for fuel. Um, gasoline had been invented, but it was regarded as a waste project and thrown away in swamps. So she filled it up at four o'clock in the morning with Ligroin and drove 36 miles from um, one German town to another to visit her mother, the first ever automobile journey in the world. And that's given us everything that we know, either love or hate, freeways, parking meter maids, you know, speeding times, congestion, yeah. pollution, and so forth. So my world has been hugely opened by books, yes. A wonderful, wonderful answer. So we'll 
go to audience questions now. Obviously, we're not going to be able to get to all the great questions that people have submitted, but we'll be able to get to uh, a few. So Guy uh, asks, is the concept of land ownership as old as history itself? Do we know how the concept originated? You do actually spend a good bit of time in the book talking about this, the agricultural origins of land demarcation. Uh, could, you, could you give a, a condensed summary of, of what we know about that? Yes, very quickly. I went to boarding school in Dorchester in Dorset in England. The village that we used to do our cross-country runs to was called Radipole, a pretty little village about six miles away, not a very long cross-country run. But that, as it happens, was the first place to enjoy or suffer what was called enclosure. The idea previously was that villages in, specifically in England, much the same occurred in many places in Western Europe too, but let's stick to England for a moment, all that land was commonly owned by everyone in the village. And so if you had a farmer with cows, your cows would be there, someone else that grew turnips, his turnips would be there, his pigs would be there and so forth. But the problem with that, the so-called the tragedy of the commons, is that the cows would eat the turnips and the pigs would eat the cabbages and the food production of this land was very much compromised. And so with the population of England beginning to grow, people started to say, how do we make land produce food more efficiently? And the way they decided was to segment the common land, enclose it, putting up fences or hedges or ditches, what are called ha hearts in the old days. And this field can belong to farmer A, where he can keep his cows. And this field can belong to farmer B, who can grow his turnips. And it'll be much more efficient. But that meant that the people that previously were on that land and superintended it or took benefit from it were thrown off. Quite literally, they were dispossessed of being part of the communal ownership. So they, as I mentioned earlier, disgruntled. Um, either they remained in poverty in the, in the countryside or went in search of fortune in the newly growing big cities, which once the Industrial Revolution began in 1776 with James Watt's invention of the steam engine started to expand mightily. Or if they didn't go to the cities, they came to this part of the world and they took with them the idea of ownership and dispossession and started visiting this on the Native Americans who they met, threw them off their land and the rest is American history. The rest is history. Uh, Anna T asks, how did you decide how to pace a book with such a large scope and, and what specific things you wanted to focus on. It's not a book that's chronologically ordered, but you, you've chosen certain themes that you thought were important to hit upon and you tie different threads together from different parts of the world and uh, thematically. How, how did you come upon the right organizational scheme uh, for this subject? Well, it's a wonderful question and, and who knows whether it's the right or, or the wrong, but when, I think when I sit down to plan any sort of big subject book, I try to think, okay, it's a good idea to write about land and it'd be nice if you can write it in a sort of elegant way. But really the, the crucial thing is the organization of it. And because you can write beautifully about a fascinating subject, but if it's organized in a bad way, people will just fall asleep or put the book down or whatever. So for this, I decided, what's it about? It's about ownership. Well, in order to own land, you need to know where it is. You need to know where its borders are. So how do you demarcate land? How do you map the land? And then how do you then acquire it? Do you buy it? Do you steal it? Do you fight for it? Are you given it? This basic concept of ownership. Um, what does it mean? And then um, what if you get people land on either side of a border, do people fight each other? Does it lead to militarization and politicization and uh, creation of national boundaries and so forth. So you have to corral all this information very carefully. I wanted to do a whole big section on stewardship. I mean, are the national parks a good thing? Is What is the reason that there is no beltway uh, around the city of Denver, for instance, and the reason that there is a big pie-shaped hole in the, in the northwest side of Denver is because the American government polluted it with plutonium, with a big plutonium processing plant, and you can't drive. There is no 495 that goes around Denver for that very reason, the bad stewardship of Rocky Mountain land around Denver. So that kind of thing, and the future, that had to be another chapter. So you have to think quite carefully, and thus far the reviewers have been 
kind to me. And, and so that makes me think that the organizational principle of this book uh, was sort of spot on, but it's a big challenge with every book. So John has a question I actually had myself uh, reading this. He says, many animals uh, in the animal world seek to maintain their own territory. And he wonders if that drive has anything to do with our concept as human beings of land ownership and, and what land means. Did, is that a topic that you considered uh, thinking through in the book directly? Is that something you've thought about yourself? Well, I, I find this whole idea of different peoples and how they what happens when they encountered each other. I mean, to give an example, if you accept that humankind began in Maldivite Gorge in Ethiopia and then spread out of the south, where it didn't go very far because they hit the sea, but went north. And then there were civilizations grew up there, the Nile Valley in the Tigris and the Euphrates, Mesopotamia, in other words, the Indus Valley uh, and the Yellow River Valley in, in China. So taking the two that were closest, let's say the, the Arab civilization based in the Nile Valley and the, let's call it the Persian civilization, which began in, the, um, in Mesopotamia, as those two grew out towards each other, unknowing of course of each other's existence, um, like um, penicillin, uh, if you like, in a Petri dish, there comes that moment, when was it? 1400, 1500, 1000 BC, when they hit each other. And where did they hit each other? And I like to think it's probably in that um, delta near Basra in what is now Iraq, where some of the most terrible uh, battles of the Iran-Iraq war were fought 30 years ago. But I think that's where the first true international boundary, and by that I mean not people that are moderately different from one another, the oldest boundary in Europe is between, I think, Andorra and Spain, but those people are more or less the same on each side. But the people on from two very different civilizations, that's a real frontier, I mean, an ethnographical frontier. And the consequences of that, I find fascinating in the same way that I, the questioner, if I understood the question correctly, finds the territorial range of, of animals to delineating territories in the jungle or the savannah or wherever, equally fascinating where it deals with human beings. It has, of course, long lived political implications too. Absolutely. So I think this is probably going to be our, our last question. It's a good question to end on. Uh, Emily wants to know what your next project is going to be. And if there are topics that you haven't explored in your work that you are really, really eager to, to take on in either your next well, it's book a lovely or question, Emily. one of the many books I'm sure you're going to write in the future. So the book I'm doing at the moment is, uh, as I was mentioning to Rosita at the beginning of this uh, story, the topic seemed to get smaller and smaller. This is on the, the history of the diffusion of knowledge. Um, the idea being that with knowledge now literally at the touch of a button, thanks to Mr. and Mrs. Google, um, I wonder, I fear, as I'm sure many teachers and so forth fear, that knowledge doesn't necessarily lodge in our heads anymore, at least to the same extent that it used to before Google and like things took off in a big way. My fear, therefore, at least this is the question in the subtitle of the book, which I'm sort of thinking of calling knowing what we know, uh, the history of the diffusion of knowledge and the threat to the future of wisdom. If you accept that wisdom is knowledge multiplied by, multiplied by experience, you may end up with people who are very old and consequently have the potential for lots of experience, but don't have as much knowledge up here as they once used to because of the presence of it at the touch of a button. And so wisdom may cease to be a component of, of the human mind. And is that worrisome? So I look at all manner of how knowledge is diffused, encyclopedias, the internet, of course, teaching, how that's changed, what everyone ought to know. And I ask everyone I meet, I'm sort of, cocktail party last weekend and I said I must be the most boring person to have a cocktail with okay I want to know what every child in the world when at 16 ought to know for instance I say I think it is useful for everyone to know both the concept of and the value of pi and you'd be surprised how many people had no idea what I was talking about people who were 16 17 or 18 or, or, or older 
I'm not going to embarrass anyone here by saying, do you know what pi is? But I think everyone ought to know that the ratio between the circumference and the radius of a circle is 0.14159. Well, I'm glad you're not going to ask because we're out of time. Uh, we've all been saved by the, by the bell here. Uh, but Simon, thank you so much for joining us here at the National Book Festival. The book again is Land, How the Hunger for Ownership Shaped the Modern World. Uh, thank you again for, for showing up and, and taking these questions. Uh, keep enjoying the National Book Festival at loc.gov slash bookfest. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>